From an archaeological perspective, the first problem with the fable of Noah's Ark and a worldwide flood is when that is supposed to have happened. Early in the 17th century, Archbishop James Usher attempted to calculate the age of the earth down to the exact date of its creation, according to the Bible. He did this by adding the ages of biblical characters who begat other biblical characters to establish a genealogical timeline back to Adam. Then he added the previous days of the creation myth to the ultimate date of origin on Sunday, October 23, 4004 BC at 9 a.m. His calculations were left unchallenged for centuries, and the so-called young earth creationists have accepted his determination of the age of the earth being roughly 6,000 years old, regardless of all the evidence to the contrary. However, they reject his date for the flood. Usher dated the landing of Noah's Ark as the 5th of May in 1491 BCE. But that was the same time that many evangelists think that Moses existed. Plus, there was so much real history established around the world by that time that even creationists knew there was no way to hide a global flood on that date. Nor could they instantly repopulate the whole world from the inbred stock of Noah's three sons. So the leaders of the Young Earth Creationism movement, can you still call them leaders if they're dragging you backwards? Anyway, they all said the flood happened sometime in the 24th century BCE. But as you can see by this collection of old buildings, archaeologists know that no such flood ever happened either then or at any other time. Because all these widely dispersed cultures around the world somehow keep on keeping on without even noticing that they had all drowned. The Apologetics Ministry and Pseudoscience Propaganda Mill Answers in Genesis explained how we can get from eight people surviving the flood to seven billion people today by doubling the population every 150 years. They say this simple math accounts for famines and other disasters, but they ignored everything we know about population growth throughout history because that's academic data and who cares about that. If Answers in Genesis is correct, which has never happened before, then even if the entirety of humanity collaborated on the construction of Egypt's first pyramid of Dozer, or Djoser, they wouldn't have had enough workers to build it as there would only have been about 40 people alive in the whole world at that time. The apologists at AIG have admitted that there would have to be a society of at least 30,000 people to provide the necessary infrastructure to complete a project of that magnitude. So they wrote another article that is not linked to the first article, because they don't want you to read both articles, where they said the population actually grew 10 times faster than they said in the previous article, without hinting that they'd written a previous article, so that no one would notice the contradiction. Obviously we did. What they said was that Egypt was founded by Noah's grandson Mizraim and his wife. A marriage of one man and one woman is rare in the Bible, but this was supposed to be right after a global extinction event. The Bible only said that Mizraim had four sons, but since females are rarely important enough to get mentioned in Hebrew scriptures, then believers assumed that there was at least one daughter for every son. Why? So that each brother could marry his sister just like their father did. Yeah. There's a lot of that in the Bible. AIG's apologists also speculate that each of these incestuous couples had eight children of their own who also had to marry each other. And despite all the defects of this genetic bottleneck, which we covered in the last video, and which renders this whole story impossible, that's how they figure Egypt went from eight people in 2188 BCE to more than 30,000 people 150 years later. Of course, what they don't tell you is that at that rate, there'd be over a million people just five years after that. And at the rate they proposed for generation, 30 years per generation, the very next generation after that one would have exceeded our current global population. That's eight people in 2188 BCE to over eight billion people by 1768 BCE, the time of Hammurabi. Obviously, religious apologists got the wrong answers in Genesis. And let's do this another way. Answers in Genesis, Creation.com, and the Institute for Creation Research all used the exact same data that Usher did, yet they came up with three different answers. But we already know how bad their math is. So let's take an average of these three dates and say that the flood happened in 2340 BC, being before the Gregorian calendar that we're currently using. That is not before the Chinese calendar, however, where Noah's flood would have happened in their year 358. So are we to believe that everyone living in China at that time drowned in the flood and that China was eventually resettled by Noah's descendants and that Noah's grandchildren eventually found that calendar and then filled in the gap and started counting it up again? Obviously not, because the Chinese were 
obviously still there and still counting all that time. And Jewish settlers wouldn't have contributed to the Chinese calendar either because they already had one of their own and it's even older than the one in China. On the Hebrew calendar, the flood should have happened in their year 1420. Again, why would they start counting from there if everyone else in the world, why wouldn't they start counting from there if everyone else in the world was already dead? Shouldn't they have started over at zero at that point? Did they think the world was created 1,420 years earlier? That might be concordant with the creationist mythos, but they can't be true because the Hebrew calendar isn't the oldest one either. That belongs to the Yazidis, a Kurdish religion from northern Iraq. On their calendar, Noah's flood should have been in the year 2409 because the Yazidi calendar is older than creationists think the universe is. So this culture has been continuously counting the years since before the beginning of time and still never noticed the flood. That's impressive for people living in Iraq because even if this was just a localized inundation of the Iraqi floodplain, as some suggest, it didn't have any lasting effect on the Yazidis. They were already there before the flood. They lived right through it and they're still there today. It's the same with so many other cultures all over the globe. So, of course, archaeologists know that there weren't just eight people in the whole world in 2340 BCE. This was the beginning of Egypt's sixth dynasty, after the death of Pharaoh Unas. Sargon was alive at that time, too, conquering Sumer and establishing the Akkadian Empire. And even if you push the date of the flood back to 2900 BCE, when there actually was a localized flood that the legends could be based on, it wouldn't help creationists. Egypt's second dynasty hadn't begun yet because Pharaoh Kwa was still alive, as were the founders of the Hong Bong dynasty in what is now Vietnam. This was also the beginning of the early dynastic period in Sumer, where Ur was the richest city and the citizens were still polytheistic and making statues to pagan gods. How does that set with there being only eight people alive in the whole world at that time and all of them worship Yahweh? We know they didn't because the Epic of Gilgamesh was composed centuries later and still centuries before the first books of the Bible, and yet it tells the same story from a pagan perspective, as did a number of other ancient pre-biblical documents, like the Epic of Atrahasis and the Eridu Genesis, not to be confused with the much more recent Biblical Genesis, which we'll talk more about in the next video. For right now, the issue is not the stories themselves, but the languages they were written in. Why were they all in different languages, many of which were derived from distinctly separate roots? If everyone in the world was supposed to be descended from the same Iraqi just a few generations earlier, they should all be telling the same story in the same tongue and text. So what about the type of text these legends were written in? Around the ancient world, people who were obviously not descended from Noah independently invented their own original and unrelated writing systems no less than five times. Whereas, if we took anything in the Bible to be literally correct, that wouldn't have happened. The oldest of these written languages are pictographs from Uruk around 3300 BCE. These were replaced with the world's first syllabic texts such that by 2500 BCE, there were already libraries and schools teaching children how to read and write in Sumerian cuneiform. So if there really was a flood, as all these creationist organizations insist, then that story would have been written in cuneiform. And every subsequent society around the world would have their written languages rooted in that style. Yet, the Mayans were still using phonetic symbols and ideograms in their pre-Columbian codices, and neither the style nor the writing or the language shows any connection whatsoever to anything going on in the Middle East. The Chinese apparently devised their volume of symbolic characters sometime in the second millennium BCE, about the same time as the flood was happening, if not before. The Harappan civilization did the same, devising yet another completely original system of writing in a language and culture that knew nothing of Noah or his god, even immediately after that boat was supposed to have landed. When everyone should have spoken Sumerian and read cuneiform and worshipped Yahweh, but no. The rest of the world already had their own civilizations, languages, and even religions with entirely different pantheons preceding the flood and persevering right through it, completely oblivious to it. Now look at the Egyptians. They feature prominently in the Bible, yet they were already writing in hieroglyphs hundreds of years before the flood, back when Noah's ancestors were still writing in pictographs. If there had been a global flood, that practice would have stopped abruptly in 2340 BCE and wouldn't be picked up again. Yet, hieroglyphs continued, just like Egypt continued, for thousands of years, all the way to the closing of the pagan temples in the 5th century of the Common Era. So there was never a time when Egypt was flooded.
And notice, neither was there ever a time when Egypt was the lifeless wasteland that the Bible said it would be in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. That's just one of many reasons why the rest of the world had their own gods and never knew about Noah's God. Not even Noah would have worshipped the Bible God. Back then, thousands of years before the formation of rabbinic Judaism or the very first word of their scriptures, Yahweh was only a Canaanite God. The name of Noah's God would have been El, back when Noah's name was Utnapishtim, Ubartutu, Atrahasis, or Ziasudra. Because that's how both characters are listed in the Sumerian king list, an archaic record of Babylonian kingdoms. It says that from the time that the kingship descended from heaven until the flood swept over, eight kings ruled in succession. So, there you have it, an archaeological record proving the biblical flood. Except that the first king isn't Adam, and the last king isn't Noah. But just as the Bible says that Adam and Noah both lived for more than 900 years, the Sumerian king list says that these eight kings lived for many thousands of years each, Their combined reigns total almost a quarter million years. That's much, much longer than creationists typically accept. There were a few dynasties after that, all with much reduced ages, and here we see a pattern that might tell us why. Notice that all the antediluvian kings reigned in round numbers, always ending in at least a double zero. That's a coincidence, isn't it? But there was no such thing as a zero back then. The number zero wasn't invented until the 3rd century BCE, which is thousands of years after we're talking about. Back then, there was no concept of abstract numbers at all. They could count things, but they used a confusing combination of different sexagesimal systems depending on whether they're counting time, cattle, volumes of grain, and so on. It was like trying to remember how many farthings were in a shilling or shillings in a guinea. Then if you're counting something else, you have to use a different currency. These various systems used different notations, but were all based on quantities of 60. That only makes sense if this base 60 numeric system was devised according to the same divisions of a circle that we still use in clocks today. Once the quantity was given, they could use spaces as placeholders between numerals and any given number where a zero would have been, and they could use tiny marks to indicate orders of magnitude. So instead of using a zero, they used these marks to raise the number ten times higher or lower it to one-tenth as much. Let him who hath understanding reckon the number of the beast, for it is a human number. Its number is 666. So it seems that the number of the beast was actually invented by Mesopotamian accountants and tax collectors taking stock of your grain. When the first versions of what would become the Bible were composed, the ages of the characters inspired by earlier Sumerian works might well have been exaggerated, but they might have only been misinterpreted. Such cryptolinguistic mistranslation has been common to archaeologists of all eras, even including the translation of the Egyptian glyphs in the 1920s. Then it was discovered that all Egyptian numeric equations and historic records would remain anomalous with the rest of the world unless reduced by a factor of 10. I suggest that the same thing happened here with all the antediluvian Sumerian kings because every one of them appears to have two orders of magnitude added onto a lunar calendar rather than a solar one. The translation error that I suspect apparently wasn't caught until recording the dynastic period after the flood. And once you adjust for double zeros by dividing by 100, then those impossible ages in the Sumerian king list as well as those in the Bible can all be divided by 12 for the months of a lunar calendar to get realistic figures. I've talked to a number of archaeological scholars about this, and they say that it is more complicated than that. However, they admit that these numbers are certainly erroneous, but that there is no formula to correct for it because the counting system is so complicated that nobody really understands it anymore. This was the first concept of counting with no sense of numerals, and it doesn't follow the kind of systematic order that modern mathematics demands. They also admit that what I'm suggesting to correct it does seem to work most of the time. There are only a few numbers that aren't evenly divisible by 12 and only a couple that don't add to zero. So the math is still problematic, but that may be because the numbers we're starting with are likely wrong too, even in the dynasties after the flood. Although there are characters in this list that are generally considered to be mythologized or exaggerated, one thing the Sumerian king list does demonstrate is that there was a flood that interrupted everything the Sumerians were doing, but did not apparently affect anyone else.
Specialists analyzing the Sumerian king list calculate the date of the flood in question as a couple centuries earlier than Gilgamesh, who himself was archaeologically and contextually dated to the 27th century BCE. Archaeologists have identified several flood deposits occurring at different times throughout the period in question, with one of them being particularly significant. The city of Shurapak was the legendary home of Ziasudra, the Sumerian version of Noah, who we'll talk about in the next video. The flood of Shurapak is associated with similar deposits also found in Kish. So this was a big flood that affected more than one town. The flood level separated late proto-literate and early dynastic remains and effectively marks the end of the Jemdat Nasser period. Pottery and such found above and below the mud layer date that flood at between 2950 and 2850 BCE. That's also precisely when a few scientists think a comet struck, forming the Burkle Crater. It's roughly 25 times wider than Arizona's meteor crater, itself a mile wide, except that the Burkle Crater is at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. So that would have generated mega tsunamis, which could be responsible for the Mesopotamian flood legends. Though that's not a widely accepted hypothesis. You could push the date of the flood back much earlier and it still wouldn't make any difference. One of the most favorited videos I ever made was soon after I started my channel. It was called An Anthropological Moment in Time. In it I cited what archaeologists and cultural anthropologists said about the development of different cultures around the globe 6,000 years ago when young earth creationists think the universe was created. I'll put a link in the description. The summary is that, just as I explained in the last video, every continent except Antarctica was already known to be populated long before 4004 BCE. All these cultures around the world were already ancient, having lived where and how they were for hundreds of generations. This temple at Golbleki Tepe, for example, is twice as old as the universe, according to young earth creationists like Ken Ham. Yet this Neolithic temple is dedicated to animistic spirits, not Ken Ham's god, because his god hadn't been invented yet. 6,000 years ago, some places were already running irrigation and mass-producing bread and beer and other goods, so they erected the first cities and towns with official government and a shipping trade, all before any date listed for the flood, and they stubbornly survived continuously through it and beyond it too, like they didn't even notice it, as if the global flood never even happened at all.